good evening everybody welcome to day 8 of virtual tour of uh, cosmos we are uh, having this program on the occasion of 31st foundation day celebration of patani samanta planetarium bhubaneswar i welcome you all to this planetarium show this show will be uh, presented by mr satish joshi from infovision now i request mr satish joshi to start this show please Thank you, sir. Good evening to all. After 10 months and traveling hundreds of millions of miles across the void of space, a robot spacecraft built on one planet lands on another. An interplanetary first. Science fact, not fiction. The date? July the 20th, 1976. The planet, Mars. To the Babylonians, it was Nergal, god of death and destruction. Its distinct red color signified blood and violence. In Norse mythology, it was Tyre, god of combat and heroic glory, after whom we named the day of the week called Tuesday. For thousands of years, this planet intrigued early sky watchers, and our fascination continues to this day. We call it after the name of the Roman god of war, Mars. Mars Hill, Flagstaff, Arizona. Observations made here would color our ideas of Mars for over half of the 20th century. Astronomer Percival Lowell built a giant telescope here, specifically to study the red planet. He dedicated over 15 years of his life attempting to solve the mystery of its changing appearance. Before Lowell's observations, it was known that Mars was about 4,000 miles across, rotated once in just over 24 hours, and had a year almost two Earth years in duration. Intriguingly, it also appeared to have seasons. At its closest, it was a mere 35 million miles away. Gazing through his telescope, Lowell carefully studied the different views that Mars presented him from day to day and month to month. Of course, this was no easy task. Earth's atmosphere caused the image to constantly shimmer and weave around. It was quite a challenge for the human eye to spot such elusive surface details. Still, Noel was not deterred. He painstakingly recorded fascinating scenes, polar caps that shrank and expanded, changing dark areas, and long lines that joined them all together. He was certain that he had observed lines of vegetation planted on the banks of giant canals. Canals that brought water from the poles to irrigate the planet's vast deserts. And that all of this was built by Martians. Until the 1960s, Many people actually believed that the Martian surface was crisscrossed by artificial canals built by intelligent Martian life forms. As our view of Mars improved, we began to see fewer and fewer lines. But even in the 1960s, our ability to see Mars from Earth was still very poor by today's standards. And so, mystery and imagination ruled. Imagine the surprise and disappointment when in July 1965, the Mariner 4 spacecraft flew past Mars and revealed a cold, lifeless world. As it sped past the planet, its primitive camera beamed to Earth scenes of a beautiful desolation. No canals, 
No cities, no vegetation, no Martians. Other sensors recorded freezing temperatures and an extremely thin atmosphere. An apparently dead world in a deep freeze. Six years later, Mariner 9 became the first artificial satellite of Mars. It arrived when Mars was totally obscured, hidden beneath a vast planet-wide dust storm. Four mysterious dark spots slowly emerged beneath the swelling clouds. These were the tops of giant volcanoes. When the dust cleared, it revealed a planet much more dynamic than expected. There were features formed by dark dust and strong winds. Craters like mud splats. Strange meandering features that looked like dried up riverbeds. And a vast canyon that spanned the surface. Mariner revealed an exotic planet with an interesting past. And an even more exciting future for exploration. It's July 1976, and the first spacecraft lander from Earth sits atop the mysterious Martian surface. It's the most sophisticated space robot yet made. Within minutes, its scanning cameras slowly construct the first pictures from Mars. In black and white, they reveal a rather bleak, boulder-strewn surface with distinct hills and crater rims in the distance. A series of filters applied to this image provided the first color picture from Mars. It revealed an amber sky with dusty clouds high in the super-thin atmosphere. In color, it was a much more welcoming world. Six weeks later, Viking 2 landed 4,000 miles away on top of a small rock and almost tipped over. This landing site was nearly identical. Boulders covered with tiny holes, volcanic in origin, litter the surface. Both landers searched for traces of life in the soil, but all the results were disappointingly negative. The soil itself was mostly sandy silicon with lots of iron oxide, essentially rust which gives Mars its red color. The carbon dioxide atmosphere was found to be 100 times thinner than Earth's, but still thick enough for weather to occur. Each Viking spacecraft consisted of a lander and an orbiter. The electronic eyes of the orbiters allowed us for the first time to experience the planet's features in considerable detail. We are heading towards the rim of the canyon named after the Mariner spacecraft. Valles Marineris is over 4,800 kilometers long. It would span the entire United States or Australia and is nearly 10 kilometers deep and 120 kilometers across. The entire Grand Canyon of Arizona would easily be lost in just one of its tributaries. In fact, canyon is far too small a word to describe this chasm. It's more like a vast fracture on the planet's surface, like the Great Rift Valley in Africa or the San Andreas Fault.
Here, the planet was torn apart by great stresses, probably emanating from the huge volcanic structure nearby, known as the Tharsis Ridge. Flying over the Tharsis Ridge, we looked down on an immense volcanic bulge in the planet's surface. This dome of lava could cover all of Europe to the height of Mount Everest. It's here that we find four of the largest volcanoes ever discovered. The most striking of them all is Olympus Mons, the biggest, broadest, tallest volcano in the solar system so far. It is so big that if you were on its slope, you would scarcely be aware of the true size of this volcanic monstrosity. It has a vent at the top into which you could fit Los Angeles and still have room to spare. Most recent data suggests that these giant volcanoes may have been active just a few million years ago. The Viking orbiters also gave us our first close-ups of two tiny potato-shaped moons. Both skim relatively close to the Martian surface and are most likely captured asteroids. Both are regarded as good landing spots for future Mars exploration missions. Here is the largest, Phobos. This captured asteroid is about 22 kilometers across, with gravity so light that an average human would only weigh a couple of ounces. Phobos skims across Mars at an average height of just under 6,500 kilometers, its orbit spiraling ever closer to the planet. Its surface is dominated by craters, cracks and fractures. They all emanate from Stickney, a massive crater about 10 kilometers across. However, this is nothing compared to the crater Phobos will make on Mars when it finally gets too close and crashes into the surface in just a hundred million years from now. Gently moving outward from Mars is its other smaller moon, Deimos, only about 15 kilometers across. Its surface is extremely dark and very smooth. It seems to be covered in a deep layer of dust that fills many of its craters. Like our own moon, it keeps one face permanently turned towards the planet. It orbits Mars every 30 hours at a distance of about 24,000 kilometers. The Viking missions changed our view of Mars yet again. Then we understood it as a sterile world, with a surface frozen in time for the last two and a half billion years. This was the accepted scientific opinion for the next 20 years. But in the late 1990s, a new era of Mars exploration began and continues to this day. From Earth, we launched an armada of landers, rovers and orbiters. Mars was invaded as never before. And the new data we found started to reveal even more of its deep secrets. 21 years after Viking, the Pathfinder mission reopened Martian surface exploration with Sojourner, the first roving vehicle that crept along at the dizzying speed of one centimeter per second. That's one kilometer in almost 12 days. This mission also carried a new strategy for Martian exploration. Follow the water. It was clear that water had flowed over large regions in the past. 
The European Space Agency's Mars Express typifies the spectacular capabilities and successes of the latest high-tech orbiters. High above Mars, it can probe deep below the soil and at the same time assess the qualities of the atmosphere. This Martian satellite provides a stream of images and data that continues to rewrite the textbooks on Mars. While the cameras relay their exquisite pictures, the other instruments have been conducting their own unique investigation. Traces of methane have been detected in the atmosphere, and this could indicate that volcanic activity or even primitive life forms exist today. Other data reveals landscapes hidden beneath the surface terrain. Radio waves have penetrated the bedrock to reveal traces of vast water ice deposits covering large areas of the planet. As yet, we have discovered no liquid water on the surface. This is not surprising, since the very thin atmosphere would cause it to quickly evaporate. However, there are major features across Mars that obviously have been sculpted by running or still water in the past. Evidence even points to sudden and sometimes catastrophic water flows. Abrupt melting of the underground ice, either by volcanic activity or meteorite strikes, could be the cause. We have very little on-site information about the poles. The ice here consists of layers of frozen water and carbon dioxide. Surface ice exists at the Martian poles. The amount varies according to the season, but over the years, ice and dust have built up in massive layers. Measurements show that at the southern pole, there is sufficient water ice to flood Mars to a depth of over 30 feet. Recent observations have discovered dark streaks on the polar ice. Some researchers believe these have been caused by gases venting through the frost-covered surface. Could they be carbon dioxide geysers firing dark dust into the air? We don't know for sure, but it is an intriguing idea. On May 25th, 2008, the Phoenix spacecraft landed just at the edge of the Martian North Pole. It will be able to drill deep into the icy soils and carries a tiny laboratory to test for organic compounds. Images of its Arctic surroundings will be beamed back to Earth. If all goes well, it will have about three months of life before it is entombed in the carbon dioxide ice of the polar winter. Temperature here is 200 degrees below zero. Further south, especially during summer, the temperature can be quite balmy at 50 degrees. Although the atmosphere is 100 times thinner than on Earth, the temperature difference between the ground and the air generates dust devils. These pockets of warm, rising air begin to eddy and swirl like a whirlwind. They pick up dust and debris and can become quite spectacular. Their earthly counterparts never amount to much. But just imagine if a dust devil in the Sahara could trigger a thunderstorm massive enough to cover the whole Earth. That's what's believed to happen on Mars, where a huge storm can cover the planet from pole to pole. Dust devils thrust up so much material that they heat up the atmosphere. This creates powerful regional storms that can spread quickly across the entire planet hiding Mars under a dusty blanket. In 2007, such a planet-wide storm made scientists fear for the safety of the two robotic rovers then on the surface. Somehow, 
these heavily dust-covered robots just managed to survive. Named Spirit and Opportunity, they have traversed the surface since 2004. The images and data which they have sent back have helped us refine further the story of Mars and provide additional data for the more remote instruments on the orbiters. Their most exciting discovery was silica. Its presence suggests that hot water springs once existed. On Earth, such springs harbor primitive life. Did they also on Mars? As we enter a new era of Mars exploration, with ever more sophisticated spacecraft, Mars is as tantalizing, as mysterious, and as exciting as ever. We've seen just how much our views of the Red Planet have changed over the last 100 years. As we began our investigation of this intriguing red dot in the sky, we discovered its mysterious canals and lines of vegetation, which were so prominent to Percival Lowell. He watched those dark markings expand and contract as the Martian seasons changed, and to him, these were clear signs of some form of life. Lowell's dreams of Mars influenced a whole generation of observers and writers. Writers who until the 1960s populated the planet with fantastic cities and alien life forms. Could this ancient world really be home to other intelligent beings? It's a good question. What this planet provided was a focus for our imaginations, a new vision of a new world, a new frontier, a new destination for brave explorers. At first a stage for fantasies, then a focus of intense scientific endeavor and study. While the winged planes of the 1950s still belong to the realm of science fiction, in the realm of science fact, engineers and scientists are designing the spacecraft which will explore Mars in the near future. At first, there will be ever-increasingly sophisticated robots. But one day, before the 21st century is 50 years old, the first manned vehicle will touch down on the Red Planet. It's possible that some of us here, or our children, will help design and build this craft. Others will crew it. And one of you could be the first person to step out onto that lonely, dusty Red Plain. The invaders of Mars will be humans. How our invasion will end, no one knows. It will be a second small step onto an alien world, a step that will take humankind to an exciting new future in the cosmos. on the left side of the 
the vehicle. GC plane.